Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Juan Londoño and I hope you're having a marvelous day. Today's topic was going to be a regular topic and I thought about it and I said, does it need to be a Photo Philosophy Friday topic? And I was kind of dangling back and forth. So it's an almost Photo Philosophy Friday topic. Now, for those of you that are new to the channel, Photo Philosophy Fridays means it releases on Friday instead of the typical Saturday. And instead of being a product review or a how-to video, you know, regarding photography, it goes a little deeper into photography topics and kind of connects it to our life and our jobs and just everything else. So without further ado, let's get started. Today's topic is everyone is a pro. And there are, you know, I was thinking about the main reasons why people would think that they're pros because I'm not talking about the real pro. Obviously, those don't need any discussion, right? I'm talking about the people that think they're pros. And so it's kind of a sarcastic title. Everyone is a pro today, right? Um, I came up with four reasons. I try to come up with a cool number like three or five in the Asian culture. I think four is kind of like a bad number. So I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody. Um, I just didn't want to shove in a topic for the sake of shoving it in there. So these four are real topics I came up with as to why I believe people think they are pros. By the way, this video is not for photographers that are trying to be professional. This, this has nothing to do with them, right? We all started somewhere. There are photographers that I know that are young, that are starting out. It doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter here. They just happen to be young are starting out, they're buying equipment, they're taking courses, they're reading, they're studying online, and they're trying their best to become professional photographers quickly, right? Kudos to them. This video is not about them. This video is about how there are so many people out there that just love to consider th themselves pros, and they're really not. The ones that I know reach out for advice, they have questions, they read, and they're trying their best to learn. And you know, it's not about them, right? This video is about all the other people that think they're fantastic uh, pro photographers and they have a long way to go. Reason number one why people believe they're pros. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Let me read it to you because it's a definition. Um, it's a study conducted in 1999 that observed that people of low ability, basically people that are terrible at doing something, um, think that they're basically much better than they are. Likewise, people who are very good tend to underestimate their competence or their abilities. Now, as usual, and I know you might cringe when you hear this, but <laughs> I have a story that goes with this. So back in 2004, I was contacted by a lady that was kind of running a, a bunch of models. I'm not going to say a modeling agency because um, it wasn't quite there yet. She was trying to get to that point and then she ended up leaving the country. Um, so she was running a bunch of you know, models, um, trying to start up an agency. And she contacted me, interviewed me with a, with a fellow coworker. And they were trying to figure out if I was going to be the right person to shoot their first line of you know, catalogs. And we had a really good time together and I ended up getting you know, uh, accepted for the job. So the day of the photo, actually before the day of the photo, like a day before, she contacts me and tells me that there's going to be another photographer joining me. And I'm not going to mention his name because it's not important anymore. But let's call him Steve. And I'm sorry for anybody that's named Steve because <laughs> you're not going to like this guy by the time I'm done with this story. I'm just picking a random name here, okay? So Steve, you know, is arrives on his cool motorcycle. And of course, I have a bike too, but... I don't go to a photo shoot where I need lights and stuff on my motorcycle. It's inconvenient. So he's got the girls around him looking at the bike and I get all out of my car and I'm starting to pull out equipment. And the first thing he does is he laughs and he says, oh, 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 oh. You have a camera that is like three times my camera and mine will do the exact same work that yours does. So already I could tell this guy's a winner. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So he had a Sony. And you know I have nothing against Sony cameras. I think they're great. Back then, my camera, brand new, you know, uh, cameras were kind of new to digital, the digital world. 
So I was in a, on a Canon 10D, which was a, you know, kind of an entry level, you know, good camera, good digital camera, not an entry level really, but like a prosumer, you know, it was a pretty decent camera. It was worth about $1,500 and we're talking like 20 years ago, uh, almost. So the lens was a 24 to 72.8, also about $1,500, that first iteration of the lens. So about $3,000, his camera was about a thousand. His lens was not detachable, it was permanent. And, you know, his camera was not a bad camera, but it wasn't very good with ISO, with low light, and we were gonna be shooting inside a house that was abandoned. It wasn't abandoned, it was a house that was getting ready to be sold. So it had no furniture, it was just painted, it looked really nice, but it was completely empty. So we get inside and we start shooting and I'm minding my own business because I don't really care what Steve thinks of me or my camera. That's the good thing about having that mentality is I was able to go on my day, go about my day, you know, happy. And I'm shooting the models that were assigned to me and the reason that they, they chose him was so that eight models could be split in two and neither of us would have to work that hard, right? And I thought that was a good idea. But they didn't pick a very good photographer. So, and, and they didn't pick a very good person for that matter. So halfway through our shoot, and it lasted all day by the way, halfway through the day, they bought lunch and uh, we hadn't eaten yet, it was right before we ate. She comes over to me, the lady that hired me, and, and said, Steve is having a little problem with his camera and with the lighting. And I went, really? Oh, he's got such a good camera though, right? And mine is so expensive. I mean, what's the problem? And she said, well, he said it's a little dark and he doesn't have any lights. And he was wondering, and this is where my brow goes up, if he can kind of work with you. And I said, well, I'm not sure what that means, but if he wants to use my camera, the answer is absolutely not because he was rude and he made fun of my gear, so he doesn't need to touch my camera. If he had been nice, that would have been something I definitely consider, right? Um, the fact that he came on his motorcycle and bought nothing with him either means he's laid back and didn't really take your job serious, or he doesn't have any gear, right? So he's gonna have to shoot outside. And if he wants to use my lights, he can shoot around me, uh, and he's gonna have to shoot my models because I'm on my time and I'm not gonna move my girls out of the way so he can make room for his girls. So he's welcome to learn how to shoot with lights. And if he wants to do that, he can shoot around me, over my shoulder, under my legs, whatever he makes him happy. So that's the story. And you see where the Dunning-Kruger effect comes into play here, right? There are three things that, that kill this guy. Let me see if it is three. Um, I wrote down, the first one was lack of knowledge of equipment. Now we've talked about how equipment doesn't really matter, right? If you're a good photographer, you can make a simple camera go a long way. But, but let's face it, there are limits to things, right? Like for example, you're not gonna compare a $50 camera with a $5,000 camera. There are things that that $5,000 camera can do that that $50 camera just can't do. Physically impossible, right? So you can be a good photographer and if you're gonna post on Instagram, you could probably get away with both cameras because resolution is shot. Um, if you're gonna do simple photography, landscapes and stuff like that, not that I'm saying it's simple, but if you're gonna shoot simple landscapes, then either camera's gonna be fine and you're probably not gonna tell the difference. But when you start pushing the bounds of physics, of the lenses, of the glass, of the camera, of speed, the $50 camera goes out the window, right? So he basically had no knowledge of his own equipment and its limitations. The other part, number two, is that he had no clue why I purchased my camera, what my intent was, what my work is, so he should never have made a comment. I would never, it would never occur to me to criticize somebody's gear for either being too expensive or too cheap um, without knowing why this person bought it or what their, the use of this gear is for, right? It could be something as simple as the person is beginning and doesn't really care, care for expensive gear. I mean, it doesn't matter. You don't make a comment like that without knowing, right? And that's one of the problems of people with the Dunning-Kruger that fall under this Dunning-Kruger effect. They think they know it all. They don't care what other people think. Uh, they've already decided that they know it all and because they know a little. And once they know a little bit about something, they've, they think that's it. That's all they need, right? And they don't open their mind to learning anything else. Whereas many people that are a little more humble 
uh, learn a whole bunch about something and then realize, oh my gosh, there's so much more to learn. I know so little. And they become even more humble, right? And, and embark on that journey to learn. So very big difference. Be careful with that Dunning-Kruger effect. And number three is probably the most obvious, right? Lack of humility, which is another Dunning-Kruger effect. Lack of humility just to not hurt somebody's feelings. If I'm standing out there already talking to the models and this guy would have gotten off his bike, I would have been a perfect time for me to laugh at him. First of all, you come to a photo shoot on a motorcycle, dude, come on. Where's your gear? Where are the lights? Where are your, bat your, your drop, your backdrops, your, your stands? Where's everything, right? Oh, that's the camera you bring? Ha, 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 ha. I could have done the same to him. It would never occur to me to hurt somebody's feelings that way. And obviously this person, Steve, which is not his name, um, doesn't really care about people's feelings, right? So lack of humility is another one. So to end this story, right, um, regarding the Dunning-Kruger effect being the first reason why people tend to think that they're uh, professional photographers is that no matter what field we're talking about, engineering, physics, math, photography, it doesn't matter. There are always going to be people that think they know it all and um, there's nothing you can say to change their mind. And you know what? They do know it all in their own head. One of the problems, and I've heard YouTubers, other YouTubers and content providers uh, talk about is that they feel terrible because they're giving advice, right? And they ask themselves many times, who am I to give advice? Who am I? I'm only 25 or I'm only 30. I'm 55, right? But still, who am I to give advice about photography to people that maybe have been shooting longer than me, um, longer than I have? Well, here's the thing. When I did, for example, the review of the lens of the 60 to 600, right, Sigma 60 to 600 Sport, um, not only did I watch about 30 videos, at least 30 videos on that lens and similar lenses, so I can make up my own mind, I went out and bought the lens, used it for a couple of months, and then decided to do the review. So I took what other photographers had said about the lens, decided if I agreed or disagreed from the two months that I used it and did my own review. So am I an expert? No, no, by no means. But I've been shooting for over 35 years and I used the lens and I watched about 30 videos and it gave me enough information to put something together that would be useful to you that maybe is embarking on a journey to figure out if this lens is right for you, right? Um, and I was hoping to make that journey a little easier. So maybe you don't have to watch 30 videos. By watching my video, by taking 35 plus years of experience, I think it's 37, and by taking the 30 videos that I saw and you know summarizing them all into one 30 minute video, I was hoping to save you a lot of time. And that's why I do it. Not because I think I know it all. I certainly don't lack the humility when, I, when it comes to these topics. I hope, I hope you don't see that, that, that I lack humility. Um, I have so much to learn, you know? I feel sometimes like, who am I to even have a YouTube channel regarding photography because I'm still learning how to do so much in Lightroom and Photoshop. But this is a journey for all of us, right? So um, I just wanted to put, put that out there because many content providers always question their ability. And here we are back to the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? You learn a little, you learn a lot, and then you start questioning whether you know enough, right? And that's the other side of the Dunning-Kruger, not the Steve side, which is you know nothing and you think you know it all, um, but it's all here. It's time for our water break. Grab your water, tea, coffee, beer, wine, whatever it is you drink, whiskey, and take a couple of sips. Water's a little better for you if you're trying to take care of yourself. So go get your water and come right back. Number two, why two, I did it this way and it looks like a one. Number two, why people tend to think they're professional photographers is basically this, cell phones. Most people get really good images from their cell phones. This, I'm not doing propaganda for this thing, I'm not getting paid by Samsung. This is the Samsung Note 10 Plus. This is an amazing phone with an amazing camera, right? Still today, there are phones coming out that don't have cameras that, that do what this phone does. So this device does, because I'm not even sure we can call these phones anymore. Like nobody uses them for phones. They use them for everything else. And I've done that. Uh, I've touched that topic in other videos, um, in other videos. So people get really good pictures from, from phones. And I've gotten my share of really, really nice pictures from phones. But 
Can you take these pictures with a cell phone? Cell phones hold a very, very important place in our society, right? After all, they say the best camera is the camera that you're actually carrying. And for probably 90% of the population or more, this is the camera they're carrying. So why not use it? But I'll tell you what, you won't find me comparing this cell phone to even my most affordable everyday carry camera because they don't compare. This thing has a sensor the size of I'm not even sure my small fingernail is, is the size. It might even be smaller than that. Whereas my, my everyday carry small camera, which I'm shooting this video with, my Canon M6 Mark II, has a crop sensor sensor, crop sensor sensor, has a crop sensor sized sensor, and it's probably four times bigger than what this phone can do. It's 32 and a half megapixels, and they're true megapixels, right? Sometimes the megapixels advertised by these phones are bogus. And if you try to enlarge any of those pictures, it's not gonna work. My camera that I mentioned to you earlier, that Canon 10D, uh, was a six megapixel camera, and I did 24 by 36 images for people's weddings that they absolutely loved. And it was a six megapixel. This, I think, is 16 megapixel, and I can't do a 24 by 36. It'll look crappy as heck. So that tells you, right, you gotta take all those numbers with a grain of salt, but you can't compare this with a camera. And yes, cell phones are equipped with software. Tons and tons of software get packed and stuffed into these things that make pictures look artificially sharper, brighter, and even more colorful. But you know what? That's not what I saw when I took the picture with it. And that doesn't make me happy. Some people don't seem to care. They love that, that the picture is brighter, sharper, and more colorful than what they actually saw that day. Can it be more? Sharp than what you saw that day? I don't know. But it can be artificially sharp. Some pictures are so sharp artificially that they don't look right. And cell phones tend to do that. They tend to soften skin. They tend to do wacky things to, to pictures that, you know, if you're a professional photographer or a serious photographer to any degree, you're really not going to care for that effect. If you and I are shooting, for example, food with this, right? I have a friend that owns a restaurant and he likes the way that pictures come out with cell phones. And you know what? I don't blame him because they come out brighter and they come out sharp and they come out more colorful, right? So the truth is, why not? He has a restaurant and he has to promote his food and, and, and the right, you know, feel. So he enjoys that. I had done some of those pictures. Actually, I never did really the food there, but I had done some pictures of drinks and stuff. And, you know, they weren't to, to his liking. And like I said, I don't have a problem because the pictures were never edited, right? I have to take the next step, which I never took, because uh, I wanted him to take a look at them first. And I think somebody came around with a cell phone and shot some really pretty and colorful pictures, and he just decided to go with those. But the flexibility I like as a professional photographer is I take the picture of the food and it comes out plain, completely neutral, the way I see the plate. Then I go on my computer back there and I start to give it all the, make the reds look red so the meat looks good, make the greens look a little greener, make everything in the background look a little softer. Um, if I have to do that, if I have a good lens, I may not need to, but there are reasons why you would want to anyway. That's another discussion. Maybe we'll do something on food photography. Um, so I get to edit that to my liking and the picture's gonna look breathtaking, better than this phone could ever do. Because what's the phone doing? It's automatically adding brightness and color and focus and the way that it wants to, right? So personally, I would have to take that picture, even taking with a cell phone, put it on my computer and alter it anyway. And if I'm gonna do that, I'd rather start with a really high resolution image, taking with a professional camera, that's just a much better starting point. As a professional photographer, as a photographer, forget professional, I want pictures to look the way I shot them 
that day, the way they looked that day when I shot them is what I should say. And even when I alter them, I still want them to look real. Sometimes my camera's a little flat and I come home and I look at the pictures and I say, and my monitor's flat and, and I look at them and say, you know what, the pictures actually looked a little nicer out in the sun. So I'll jack up the saturation just a little and the, and the you know, vibrance and things like that just to get a little bit of what I saw that day. And that's where I leave it alone, right? Just my personal touch. Now, is it wrong to saturate your pictures every once in a while or do HDR? Or, no, not at all. I think it's a cool effect on some pictures, right? There are some towns or villages, especially in Europe around water, that you know you take, them, take the pictures at night and then you saturate the colors and everything looks spectacular. Why not have a picture like that? If you want to hang it up in your living room, if one of your customers thinks that's cool and wants to buy it, go to town with it, enjoy it. But every picture, every picture that we take shouldn't look that way, right? Because then they lose, they lose their, that special thing that you're doing to, to the picture. If every picture is super saturated and HDR, then what's the point, right? The third reason is auto mode. It's that lovely A on the dial of any camera where the camera makes all of the decisions for you. That lets people think that they are professional photographers because they can go out and buy any camera or even better, if they have money, they can buy a really expensive camera and they can put it in automatic and the camera's gonna do a great job. I've seen photographers shooting weddings in automatic. Not a topic for this video. <laughs> It's a different discussion for another time, but imagine that. Cameras are good enough today that, you know, they have enough software in them and artificial intelligence that they know what to focus on and they know where to meter the light from. So they know that the picture needs to be the right amount of light according to faces involved in the picture, right? And that's fantastic, but it's not professional. And what I mean by that is that a professional photographer takes pride in adjusting their camera so that they get the right amount of light according to the knowledge of what they know about photography and lighting. No matter how smart a camera is or can get, it can read your mind. And it's not going to know what creative effects you want, what creative angles you want, what creative you know, looks you want from your pictures. And even if this is packed with software and artificial intelligence, it's not going to give you what you're looking for. It's going to make pictures artificially and consistently colorful, bright, you know, sharp. But if you're looking for something special, you're going to have to take that picture and you're going to have to edit it on your computer. And you're better off starting with something that's neutral, not with something that's jacked up with colors and poor image quality. If you take a novice, somebody that's new to photography, and you give them a really nice modern camera, um, they may not know what their creative options are and they may not care. So putting the camera in automatic mode makes a lot of sense. I'm not knocking automatic. I think it's a wonderful option for many people. Heck, there are, I don't put my camera in automatic, but there may be a time one day where I hurt a finger or I have a severe headache and I have to get some pictures taken of the family and I may decide to put it on automatic. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm afraid of automatic personally. I don't know what it's gonna give me. Uh, the picture may look pretty, but but I, you know, when I'm when I'm teaching my photography class, I'll talk about automatic mode because that's one of the modes you know you learn. And when I take the pictures, even in here in the house, and I look at them, you know, the picture looks pretty, but then I look at the at the for example the, the shutter speed, and it's like a fifteenth of a second. I'm like, oh, when you zoom into the picture, you see that it's a little blurry, and I'm like, oh, you see why, you know, I don't play in automatic. You can get away with most of the things most of the time, but personally, I'm afraid of automatic. <laughs> I'd rather do things like aperture priority, shutter priority, or some of these flex modes where, you know, you set aperture and shutter speed and it kind of picks the ISO for you, depending on whether you need more light or less light. Just a little better for me. But again, this is personal, you know, do what's better for you. And you know what? I talk about novices. I have nothing against novices. We. We're all novices in photography at one point. Those of us that are a little more experienced. My bird is chiming in here. And she's having a good time. And hello. And um, 
And we're going to continue to be novices. Those of us that like to learn and like to jump into new things, I'm learning new software for editing, um, trying to learn, you know, an instrument. I mean, there's always something we're going to learn and we're going to be novices at. Keep that spirit. It's wonderful. The more we can be novices, the more things we're learning. So nothing wrong with being a novice, not knocking it. All I'm saying in this video is don't compare and don't confuse a novice with a professional photographer because they're totally different. And when you need the professional photographer, the novice is just not going to cut it. The fourth category that lets people think that they're professional photographers these days is the editing tools and the filters. Now, by editing tools, I'm talking about Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, right? All the software suites that are out there, there's, there's a ton of them. Whichever one you use, they're pretty good these days. They can let you take subjects out of a scene or take the scenes out of the subject and replace them. I mean, you have so much flexibility and that's just the beginning. You can do so much stuff. You can put makeup on people. You can clear faces. You can clear acne. You can, oh my gosh, you can change colors all together of clothing. That's what fashion companies do. A model will wear like a white tank top and then they'll do the color matching and show you the same picture of the model wearing that same tank top with all eight different colors, right? And all they're doing is changing the color on the tank top just with a click of a button. It's amazing. So they're no, they're not paying the model to pose in eight different t-shirts. It doesn't work that way any, anymore. They save a lot of money when it comes to that. The other thing we're talking about here is the filters. You go on Instagram or any of the, of the platforms, any of the social media platforms, and I'm not knocking them. I think flexibility is fantastic. They offer filters. When I post my pictures on Instagram, I can scroll through. Many times, I don't want to touch my pictures. I want the picture just like I took it. But there are times if I'm shooting an airplane in the sky and it's a gray sky, I'll play around with the filters and see if there's something that looks a little more captivating, pulls it out of the sky a little better and because I didn't spend a lot of time editing it. You know, it's a plane in the sky. I mean, I don't go crazy on that stuff, but you know, the filters are kind of cool. So these filters many times allow people to take crappy pictures, semi-crappy, half decent, um, and they can enhance them to make them look a lot better. Like I said earlier, there's nothing wrong with an oversaturated image or uh, HDR or over sharpened at times, but you don't want that to be the norm. I've seen uh, profiles on Instagram and other platforms where the photographer just oversaturates everything. Now, you look at it from a distance and everything looks really pretty and really bright. But after about five images, I can't see anymore because it's just too much color. And I know that it's artificial. It wasn't like that the day the, the streets, the buildings, the sky, everything is overly saturated. It looks cool for one picture. It might even look cool sitting over my sofa. I might buy a picture like that, but I don't want every picture in my portfolio to look that way. It takes away from me as a photographer if I'm relying on my software or my filters to give it all that color and make them appealing. Let's face it, overly processed images sell. I mean, there's a market for them. That's why I say I'm not a judge here. Um, but me, personally, I don't want all my pictures. Yes, I have a couple that are overly saturated and I think they look cool, but I'm not gonna do that to every picture. Um, but you know what? If you're making a living oversaturating your pictures and people are buying them and putting them all up in their living rooms and bathrooms and hallways, then kudos to you because you figured out a niche, a niche and a market and you're attacking it and nothing wrong with that. Go to town, but personally, me as a, as a pro photographer, I want my pictures to resemble what I saw that day. And then I'm going to play a little bit with the sky. If it's a little dull, I'll make it look a little, you know, a little sharper or maybe a little more colorful, right? Uh, sometimes I want color away from things so I can focus on, on the subject. That's very popular, especially in portraiture photography, right? You want the person to stand out, so you kind of dim out a little bit of the surroundings, right? Um, but popping a filter where, boom, everything is like 10 times brighter, uh, yes, it's going to sell for some people, uh, but it's not my cup of tea. And it's not just that it's not my cup of tea, it's a way that somebody who is beginning in photography can seem like a professional, which is the point of this video. The whole point is not to confuse overly processed pictures with professional work. There are times that professional photographers also enhance their pictures heavily. But you know what? 
take a picture with this or with a regular camera or any camera for that matter and if you're a novice and you're a professional and then you go to town on that picture and do HDR and saturate them most likely you're going to tell the difference too so my point is keep that in mind right there's a difference as a conclusion at the end of the day and I seem to say that right uh, quite a bit at the end of the day to the viewer it doesn't matter right who shot the picture that's hanging up in their living room if they like the picture they like the picture whether it's a professional photographer an amateur if it's somebody using a phone if it's somebody using a, a six thousand dollar camera whatever it is if they're happy with the picture they're happy with the picture outside of course of the Dunning-Kruger photographer whose work actually does stink but they think that it's great where any of this matters and keep this in mind where any of this matters is when you actually need a photographer yourself. I'm a photographer, I consider myself okay. I'm not gonna say I'm great. I consider myself okay. There's gonna be a time where I can't shoot my daughter's wedding, where I can't shoot my daughter's uh, quinceanera or sweet 16, where I'm gonna to have to hire a photographer. And that's all I'm saying. Keep in mind that many photographers appear to be professionals and they're not. It can make the difference between you being really happy with the pictures you get that day and being incredibly upset. So just make sure you hire somebody that knows what they're doing and not just somebody who knows how to make their pictures flashy or uses a cell phone. Well, they're not going to shoot the, uh, your event with a cell phone. That would be rude <laughs> and disrespectful. Uh, and I'm professional. Um, make sure it's not just somebody who knows how to you know, edit right in post-production. And, and please make sure it's not somebody with a severe Dunning-Kruger effect that just is going to sit at the interview when you interview them and boast about how great they are and they actually know very little. If this video was useful, entertaining, if you enjoyed it, please pass it along, like it down here on this side, and please subscribe. Love to see you come back. We're going to do a whole bunch of interesting topics this year, including a bunch of product reviews that I've already written down. Um, so love to see you back here. Thank you for your time. I love you guys from the bottom of my heart. And as always, we will catch up in the next video. All right, here we go. Oh, my water. How can I do a video that takes water breaks if I don't have my water? It's not a tuba. <laughs> That's a funny movie. <laughs> Not a tuba. All right. Let me know if you remember what movie that's from. Now I'm gonna have some music playing, and then the pictures are gonna be rolling by. My bird isn't dancing. That's weird. When I do that, she dances. <laughs> Let's get going with the video. Oh, my computer's still on. Good. Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Um, let's change it up a little bit. Hi right, sweetheart. Good to know. I'll see you guys later.